we, we just got started with the, with the call here when I asked, how can I pronounce your name <laughs> correctly? Because English is not my first language. So, so Miron Langsner, uh, welcome to the podcast. And I'm, I'm very happy to have you here because, um, like I said, you know, before we started recording, I've been following your work a little bit from, from a distance. I, I follow a bunch of people from a distance that they never know about. And I think that's great. <laughs> uh, I just well, like the work. The internet. Yeah. And, uh, well, you, you wear many hats. I mean, we're mainly going to talk today about you know you work as a fight director for stage and and for tv and movie and so on uh, but you're also a playwright uh, if i say movement specialist is that is that also a good uh, yeah i use that i use that title often okay what what, what am i missing is there anything more it, it's um, totally quite a scholar i mean i used to be an academic my line is that i realized academia was no business for an honest man and so i sell real estate in new york city Okay. <laughs> and, uh, lately, I've started to write a lot about the economics of being an artist. Nice. And that's something that is an extremely impolite conversation. Yeah. So I gave a talk about that a few weeks ago, and one of my close friends came, and they said that the vibe I gave was of a eight-year-old talking about sex at the dinner table. <laughs> what was, was, nobody got angry afterwards. Um, well, people got so so the story of me giving that talk yeah. is so it's extremely difficult to make a living as an artist in the United States and I imagine many other places. Yeah. And one of the things that you don't necessarily realize is that many of the people who are full time artists have their money come from something else. Sometimes the something else is a trust fund. Sometimes it's a wealthy spouse. A lot of times it's another job. And I started having friends who were professors ask me if they could send students to me individually because they had students come to them who didn't come from wealthy families who realized that they were going to move to a big city and needed to have a way to make money that wouldn't take over their entire lives, that would still leave them time and energy to to do the work they cared about. And I had this conversation with multiple students who all were very grateful. Yeah. And I approached someone, I approached my friend at one of these schools, said, why don't I just talk to a bunch of students at once? And they said, that's a great idea. Let's put you in touch with the person who teaches this class on professional skills. Have a long talk with that person. And they were very enthusiastic about me coming in. And they had announced to their class of master's students in musical theater performance. I will not name the institution. I want to, but I won't. And the students rebelled against the idea of me coming in. <laughs> that, that's and, a great audience to be in front of. <laughs> yeah. And like, they, so he told me, like, in good faith, I cannot bring you here because the students are too hostile. And I'm sitting here thinking, like, if you're doing a show and I'm your fight choreographer, it's because you're in a good show. Because yeah. I have a very strict love or money policy. So this is a bad choice. So I was like, okay, forget it. Like, it was an interesting story. I told a few people. We laughed about it. We thought, okay, like, these poor kids are good. And, you know, we were talking about, like, youth and arrogance and arrogance in the martial arts. There's a lot yeah. of arrogance in, the, in any of the arts, not just the martial ones. So put that aside. And then I had a similar conversation with someone who was in the local community board. And he was like, oh, this is great. I need to have you come into the community board because we're doing a lot to help artists and they should hear this. I thought, OK, great. Happy to do that. He introduced me to a senior person who basically was like, we don't want real estate people. <laughs> and it took all of my self-control to be like, if I'm in your neighborhood, it's too late for you. <laughs> so awesome. So this already happened twice. So then NYU Tisch School of the Arts, which is a very prestigious, well-known organization, had this alumni day of events where alumni, current students, grad students could present. So I thought, okay, let's try this. So I pitch it to them. And in my experience of having done a master's degree there, everyone pretends to be a socialist or thinks they're a socialist. 
<laughs> I thought there is no way in hell I'm going to give this talk at NYU. They say yes. I go, oh shit, now I have to do this. So I present this slide deck and there's, and I have actual statistics because one of the things that I did in the last few years was I did a deep dive into studying business and finance. And one of the things I learned about finance is it was way easier than people present it. It's fifth grade math and buzzwords. And I like looked up the statistics and said, this is what the National Endowment for the Arts says artists make. This is area median income from New York City. It's about a $40,000 difference. And I started showing like, here's the numbers. Here's case studies of people who lead both lives. Here's, you know, and there's also a, a, a friend of mine, this woman, Jenna Clark Embry, put a tweet out a few months ago that went viral where she said that any 40 under 40 or 30 under 30 list in the arts needs an asterisk with the net worth of the families. <laughs> that, that's a good point. And that's a really, because, because, and that was part of my thing is like, you have to be able, you have to realize if you are not someone who comes from wealth, that you're in direct competition with the people who do. Yeah. And that it's incredibly impolite to talk about this. But you could be doing a show where you're being paid $500 a week. And you get on the subway while someone else is picked up by a chauffeur. Yeah. And what is the connection between the labor you're doing and the money you're getting? And in a perfect world, we would all be paid for what we want to do. We don't live in a perfect world. And in, and, you know, I kind of noticed, uh, so I used, when I said I used to be an academic, I went all the way to PhD. So my name starts with doctor when it makes a difference, which is very rarely. <laughs> but I kind of noticed I was in school with people who were living in much nicer apartments than me, driving much nicer cars than me, eating at much nicer places. I'm going like, okay, we're all getting the same crappy stipend. I'm reasonably good at math. <laughs> What's different? And a lot of people that I was in school with came from significantly wealthier families than me. So I'm a first generation American. I come from refugees. I did not grow up with a lot of money. And I was in this field where everyone had an infrastructure I didn't. So when I left academia and I was and you know, I was working as a freelance, I was making more money in Boston as a freelance fight choreographer than I would have been teaching. So I just kept doing the fight choreography and that ended up being as I, as I got, you know, more work, this ended up being my main income, which is highly unpredictable. Yeah. And when it became time for a change, I landed in real estate through all kinds of means and realized that the same um, comfort with uncertainty was extremely useful. Because we're commission only, you eat what you kill, as they used to yeah. say in Wall Street in the 90s. And certain other things, I, I published the piece on skills that stage combat gave me for real estate. And one of them was space relations. Because if you can look at a stage, and it's funny that we said we're going to talk about fight choreography, and I started with academia and real estate. But if you can tell that a stage can hold a broadsword fight, you can tell if it's going to hold a queen size bed. And normal people, because I think martial artists have really similar stage or so, really similar space relations, because yeah. this is one of the crossovers, because I got into stage combat out of theater. I got into theater out of martial arts because I grew up doing I was a wrestler, a fencer. I was very serious in Okinawan karate. I was told if I take a dance class, it will make me a better martial artist. I took a dance class. I was surrounded by beautiful women who were friendly to me. <laughs> but this is amazing. Let's keep taking more of these classes. And then looked around and realized I was a theater major. But um, but when I talk about... One of my sister's uh, childhood friends, uh, well, you know, when she was a teenager, he uh, went into ballet 
and and he was a good looking guy and <laughs> he, he was the only straight guy in the whole in in the whole outfit there <laughs> yeah i'm sure he had an amazing time <laughs> uh i mean it's something like you you don't know that that's coming to you like you don't know that you're just it cuz i thought oh this is and it's also a phenomenal workout yeah. like i had muscles and like cuz i came in as like this you know, very serious martial artist and was like, why am I sore in places that I didn't know I had muscles? Yeah, but people have no idea how how physically demanding ballet is for men and women alike. It's people have oh, yeah. no clue and just how how intricate and detailed the um, the control of the body is. There's a there's a really um a, a nice video on YouTube somewhere that I saw. What's her name again? The the first black prima ballerina in New York, um, Copeland, um, so. Misty, Misty Copeland. I think. Yeah, I think it's her. Uh, anyway, she's working with with one of the teachers, and the only thing she, I think, she's standing in plié, and and he's just with these minute, small pushes and feeling and touching. Now tighten up this here. Feel there. Did you feel that? Yes, yes. Ooh, that makes a difference. You're looking at the video, you're not seeing anything. Yeah. You're seeing exactly nothing. And the overlap with a lot of martial arts, and especially with what is called, quote unquote, internal martial arts, is is right there. It's like there's a lot of stuff oh, yeah. you will never see it. You have to feel it, and somebody has to coach you through it and so on. And um, and I found that I mean that a lot of people just just really totally dismiss ballet as this is nonsense. No, no, no. There's a there's another fun video you can find where uh, the way that ballet dancers jump and land is compared to basketball players. Oh yeah. And the basketball players they will ruin their joints, their ankles and knees take this beating. I mean, like there's no tomorrow where people in ballet don't. Because the way they land uh, is much different. So it's it's. All these kinds of fun stuff. There's a lot to learn from different arts. Well. There's tons of parallels between dance and martial arts. And there's some stuff that a lot of what I got out of academia in terms of what it took back to the language I use to talk about martial arts and dance is there's things that we all know or that we all have thought about intuitively, but we haven't had the language for. Yeah. And the way that, and and a lot of the people who go in depth about the study of these things are not necessarily the people who are putting in gym time. And on top of that, the academy itself, at least in the in the United States and Europe, puts a lot of focus on the written word and not on physical tradition. So you have, I was once in a discussion about a book about tango and I asked in class, has anyone here actually danced tango? And also, I have to say, in academia, I'm a light-skinned, heterosexual, straight, Israeli, American man. So I'm already the worst thing you can be. <laughs> and I'm sorry I'm laughing, but it's... it's I mean, oh, it's hilarious. I, I get your point. I mean, I get it's it. It's especially hilarious now that I'm out. Yeah. Because now it's like, oh, I'm not like I was told outright by faculty members that this would be a problem on the academic job market. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not on the academic job market. So like my brain to mouth filter is in shambles. <laughs> but it, I, go ahead. I ask in this discussion, like who because there was this this book about the politics of tango. And like the tango is the soul of this people. And there was nothing, and there was no discussion whatsoever about technique. And I was like, who, who, who here has danced tango? And there's this pause and someone looks at me and says, well, what do you mean by dance? And what do you mean by tango? <laughs> and I wasn't allowed to have your reaction in that popular <laughs> room. Uh, how did you keep a straight face? I mean, I got in a lot of trouble a lot of the time. Like I had a friend who was in kind of like the feminist studies track. Yeah. This was in this was in the master's and the PhD. I got in different trouble. Um, and she told me that once that, you know, the other feminists give me shit for being friends with you. <laughs> but but that was also like, you know, when you first encounter it and like you're young and you're serious, it's really perplexing. 
And if this video gets out, I'm going to 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 like certain parts of that world, I'm going to be in trouble for it because yeah. I've, I've just committed multiple sins and I can talk to you about those sins. But, you know, it wouldn't make sense. It would or like the, the amount of time I would have to explain this. These are the things I just did wrong. Yeah, well, and, and I, I get it. I mean, I do have some friends in academia and um, the academia in the US and over here in Europe is, is not entirely the same, but there's a lot of parallels. And I, I, did, it, um, I did a podcast interview with Mark McKeown uh, last week and, and published this earlier. And we talked about that. And one of the points that I made was that typically here in, in my area of Europe, we have three pillars to our society for the past several thousand years. It's the old Gaelic traditions, it's the Greco-Roman ones, and it's the Christian slash Catholic one. These are everything that you see historically has grown into our society is from those, those three pillars. I said there's a fourth one, American culture. And that has taken over, especially these last, let's say, 10 years. Um, it's, it's, people have no idea how much influence there is. And in academia, that is being felt now you know, as well, the whole woke thing, the postmodernist movement is in academia, academia here as well. Like it, it's, oh yeah, I've, I was warning about this for I mean, years ago when I saw it happening in the US. I saw a lot of the stuff going on, the, the postmodernist stuff that I was like, this is insane. I mean, this, and, this, this is going to lead to violence. And they're doing the same thing back home now. Oh, yeah. And well, the problem with when you discuss it outside of academia is I can tell you with a straight face and conviction having felt the worst of it or a lot of the worst of it that there's some incredibly useful aspects of it <laughs> and they are often buried because when i as i think we got down this tangent when i said there's language that's useful so there's a theorist he's a italian man who ended up in copenhagen and he was the first to introduce certain pieces of polish theater to the rest of the world but he has a concept that he calls the decided body. And the decided body is a body that has been created through, through rigorous training to behave within a certain cycle of movement. And this would include ballet dancers and sumo wrestlers, where the sumo wrestler has forged their body, has created their body to work incredibly well in a specific set of movements in a specific context. And the same is true of ballet dancers. The same is true of any kind of, or almost every kind of martial artist, almost every kind of professional level dancer, true of opera singers. When you look at other sports, it's harder. Like when you look at a basketball player, you can say, okay, this is a big, tall, athletic person. But the, if you scaled things, I don't know that you could tell the difference between a basketball player, a baseball player, and a rugby player just based on their musculature. Yeah, yeah. But you can tell a sumo wrestler, you can tell a ballet dancer. I mean, I don't know that you can tell a Thai boxer without looking at their hand, or like a, a Okinawan karate person without looking at their hands. Yeah. There's a story of my sensei, my 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 karate sensei, where he was going through customs in Okinawa, and he is this like Italian American dude who was the first disciple of these Okinawan teachers. And he's going through the he's going through customs, and they see a bunch of weapons, and they pull him aside, and he says he's a karate instructor, and they looked at his hands, and they said, "This way, sensei." <laughs> Nice. Yeah, the, I, I'm, I don't know if I'm if if I'm understanding the concept correctly, but it it reminds me of uh, what in Chinese martial arts they call Shen Fa, which is body method, which is not the same thing as body mechanics. So that's a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, I think a good uh, a good explanation might be specific body mechanics, like a system yeah. of body mechanics, uh, which is like if if you if you watch all these, you know dance contest type reality TV shows. There's one over here called So You Think You Can Dance, yes. where you enter and you have to do all the different kind of genres of dances, all the different styles. You see these break dancers who are incredible at what they do, and then they have to do like a rumba or, uh, or uh, you know, uh, some sort of salsa or other, you know, 
typical style of dancing or ballroom stuff that they really have no idea what they're doing. Like a quick step, they're like, holy crap, what is this? And like yeah. their body mechanics don't work. They can't make it work. It's rare. Oh, yeah. uh, I'll put it that way. It's rare. It's rare or it's something that has to be worked on in their training. Because yeah. there's another phraseology that I've used a lot that I haven't seen a lot of other people pick up on. But Michel Foucault uh, has a concept called technologies of the body. Hmm. And martial arts would fit into that concept because it's it's a system of movement that changes what you're capable of. Yeah. And, you know, I am in I, I so I had a hip replacement a couple of years ago and I'm in I'm recovered from the hip replacement. I'm not recovered from three and a half years of having had having of should have having had this hip replacement already. I I feel you right there. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm trying to get my body back. And the way a friend of mine put it is you're trying to get your hardware back up to software spec. Because I have all of this muscle memory yeah. and I can play through it in my head and I know where my body's supposed to go, but the responsiveness is not there. Yeah, and same, same here. So, yeah, so you, you know, and, but I know that the, I don't, I, I think there's a lot to be done with neuroscience with this. And some of it has been done where we talk about, okay, what, what your muscles, what your body knows how to do and what your body's capable of doing is going to change as you age. And having worked in choreography and a lot of like, you know, I've done everything from like big deal, regional, like major theaters to high schools. And I've worked in high schools where I would be working with these kids and you could see that they didn't know where their center of gravity was. Or that they were moving like their center of gravity was like 10, well, well you're in Europe, um, 20 centimeters lower. Yeah. It was about three inches. But, and it probably was 20, 20 centimeters lower two weeks ago because they have a growth <laughs> spurt and their, their body, their internal map of their body and the place their body actually was was in, in different places. Yeah, I, and, I, call it, I call it not being at home in your own body. If you can see it, you can spot right away. It's like, okay, the, the coordination is all over the place and they're just struggling to figure out their their own limbs and, and so on. And some and sometimes it's because sometimes you see kids who had some sort of discipline and they're recalibrating. And sometimes it's just because in in a modern life, there's very few demands to know your own body. That is true, and it's a shame, and it's 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 worse. It's a problem because more and more people are living sedentary lives. I mean, obesity rates are through the roof, uh, with all the problems that come with that, uh, health wise and so on. And and people don't. I mean, and and I have to. I mean, I have to be careful myself. I bought a smart watch years ago uh, for many reasons, but one of them uh, is that during the pandemic, I've never been sitting down in front of a computer more than then, and. Everything went online, like lots of Zoom trainings, lots of Zoom calls, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I, I started a membership website and then a bunch of other stuff, so loads of computer time. And I and I saw that I was doing sometimes like not even two thousand steps a day. It's like wow. just no. I, I would work out obviously, but just steps a day, no. And now I'm like, okay, I I need to have my minimum of six thousand steps a day. Absolutely, the, the watch will tell me when I'm when I'm not getting there. I'm like, nope, I'm going for a walk with the dog now. It's funny as a real estate agent, I can have days where I walk 13 miles. Yeah, <laughs> and I can have days where I'm at a desk all day. And yeah. you know, part of the reason that I I like the job is I get to walk all over New York City with all kinds of different people all the time and have different perspectives because you spend the day with people. Yeah sometimes many days depending on what transaction they're doing and you're talking about more than square footage yeah of course so, then as, as, as a quick you know tangent uh, my brother-in-law went to spain for um um uh, yeah, i don't know i forget how many years that they've been married uh, him and his wife and he shows you know his smartwatch at the end twenty five thousand steps that day wow. and then, so i respond why do you want to kill your wife and he's like what so I send the graph of all-cause mortality with correlating with number of steps, and and it, if 
it's really high when you do zero steps and it just plunges towards I think two three thousand steps and it kind of levels out at around six seven thousand steps a day and then it very slowly goes down again when you get to 10 12 13 14 and so on uh k steps a day but I think it's at 15 or 16 k a day for women it goes slightly up again whereas for men it keeps going down it's like see 25,000 steps a day you want to kill your wife she got it and, and, and he's like i don't get it and she's a financial controller she's like no i get it <laughs> so she, her it and stands. Uh, yeah, she, she got it uh anyway small, small tangent speaking of new york what's it like now because i hear a lot of negative stuff so um business wise it's back to normal okay so everything is open again everyone is out um the things you're hearing about you're hearing about the crime coming back up so it's not the New York of my childhood. Okay. So it, it, there's definitely an uptick in incidents, but I think one of the things that we forget is that we live in one of the least violent time periods of history. So a side effect of it being one of the least violent time periods of history is any incident of violence is magnified in terms of its reaction and perception. Yeah. So if you hear about someone being shot, it's, oh, my God, someone was shot. Where I, you know, it's a while ago, but I, th I feel like I have memories of my childhood of hearing the news in the background that my parents were listening to. And instead of talking about incidents, they talked about statistics yeah. of not of like, this is how many shootings we had last week. This is how many, so so when you hear about an incident, and I mean, I am seeing more, you know, distressed people in trains, I'm seeing more homeless people, I'm seeing more uncomfortable incidents, and I'm seeing them sometimes in places where they are understood to be less common. Yeah. But it's not, it's not the New York of my childhood. I think it's still one of the safest cities. Um, Things happen everywhere. We're a city of 10 million people. Some of them are assholes. <laughs> so, but, yeah. but like, yeah, it's also like, you know, the things you're hearing are you are most likely because people are more aware. Well, I, I remember reading about this, I think, last year, um, pretty late uh, that the, the crime statistics were going up in places like New York, San Francisco, um, Los Angeles, and so on. And that for stuff like, you know, um, you know theft uh, and, and robbery, that was, they were pretty high, but also a bunch of, you know, increases in murder stats. So that, that like the specific types of crime seemed to be on the uptick. And that was most like due to COVID and then the whole defund the police movement that, that was, uh, in full swing for a while and then died off and now it's like please we need to hire more more police officers that's that's uh what all those things are doing now <laughs> that's another side effect of us living in relatively nonviolent times because it's um one of the things i tell people as a fight choreographer is that unless you're leading a really truly horrible life the overwhelming majority of violent things you have seen are designed by people like me and if the vast majority of the violence you've seen is actually, I'm going to pull out the critical theory again, is actually simulacra of violence, where it's a physical story that reflects a narrative that has violence in it, but has nothing, has very little to do with how violence works. Then when you're faced with anything resembling real violence, it's shocking. Because yeah. it doesn't look like it does on TV. It doesn't look like it does in the movies. Um, when you see it on stage, there's different suspension of disbelief. But it doesn't look like that either because everything you've seen has been created for narrative clarity. Yeah. And even if you're watching sports, sports have been kind of engineered so that people can follow them. Because if you think about the early UFC... It did not have an audience. No. It was like you and me and 20 other guys in the world going, oh, look, he got half a centimeter closer in his grip. And 40 minutes late, like there was those, those Gracie matches that. Yeah. So 
when people talk about what they're seeing, what they're experiencing, what they actually can do when faced with incidents, it's it's rare that they're right. And I think we were talking about this earlier where I'm a reasonably good martial artist. I have been around the real dangerous, badass people enough to realize there is no way in hell I'm, I am one of them, ever was one of them, or ever will be one of them. And we, and like, I, but I, I know enough to understand what I'm seeing. And I keep watching people's reactions to violence in the news. And this is especially true of anything that happens in the Middle East, where it's like they're describing a soccer game. And it's like, why did that team need to score so highly against that other team? Why didn't he? I, I often see comments of why didn't they just shoot the gun out of his hand? <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got an article on my blog somewhere. It's called, uh, I'll put a link in the show notes. Everything you know about violence is wrong. Yeah. Uh, I, one I day I'll, I'll write a book about that. I think I've read that. I think we need to, we're, you and I are going to co-write this book or we're going to cite each other a lot. Because one of the best things I've ever seen about that that's geared towards martial artists is Rory Miller's first book, Meditations on Violence, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, on just the difference between training and how things happen. Like that was some of the best articulations of that. And these are the people who are actually seeking this out and seeking out like, okay, this is what this is. And then like in the speech combat world, there's a lot of people who come from martial arts but anyone who comes into stage combat out of martial arts is 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 often like approached with great caution and you know i'm someone who made some mistakes coming in as well because you know when i was growing up doing karate i could kick someone in the hair and thought okay this would be great for stage and that's a horrible idea for stage and because a lot of theater training a lot of acting training is unlicensed abusive group therapy <laughs> that's a nice way to put it <laughs> and i've said this publicly many times and i haven't gotten into trouble for it yet but i look forward to the day when i get to point it out a little bit more but a lot of the training is not necessarily focused on physical acting and physical acting is much gets much closer to narrative one of the things I've written about in stage combat is because in theater, in acting training, you talk about conflict and objective. Yeah. And they are what they sound like. Like your character has an objective and before they get to their objective, there's conflict. If you're choreographing a duel to the death with broadswords, conflict and objective is clear. That is some of the best opportunities for acting you can give someone. It's like that man's trying to cut your head off. That's his objective. If you have conflict, your objective in your micro objective in this moment is to not have your head cut off, perhaps put your sword over here. And then there's this symbolic language that doesn't, that has a distant relationship to what actual technique would be, is used to tell that story. And that ends up being like, okay, here's clearly what the acting is. And I have a back burner piece that I need to finish writing about that, you know, I look forward to the backlash for this. Uh, if you have, <laughs> Sorry. If you have a performance training program and you're not teaching stage combat, you are morally bankrupt. <laughs> That's going to go over well. <laughs> Well, there's something interesting that's happening. I don't know how closely you follow, but if there's anyone who's following this who's who's um, in entertainment, there's been a tremendous response to intimacy choreography. Yes, and, yeah, yeah, I've, I've and the, heard about that. Yeah, the people who created that come out of the stage combat world. Mm. And they, and you know, the stage combat people are obsessed with safety for very good reason. and they saw a need, they filled the need, and the response has been overwhelming. And mostly it's a good thing, but there, I saw a few people start calling themselves intimacy directors, and I don't know how they got those credentials and how they decided to self-certify as that. 
Yeah. But the response from institutions has been, this is a thing we need and we need this to keep people safe. And because a lot of the technique is closer, like you don't need to spend tons of contact hours with sword work to get that, it was easier for institutions to understand. Now, the amount of times that you know, if you if you have other stage combat people on your show ever, and you want to watch them flinch, say the words, "It's just a slap." <laughs> and the amount of times that people will hear that, and the amount of times that people will just throw something together, and I've heard a lot of stories about injuries, and I, I have a page on my website of news stories about stage combat injuries and i have a theory that otherwise perfectly rational people lose their damn minds on stage because it suddenly pretend and i tell them like listen like the stage is like is like the matrix if you get hurt there you get hurt in real life too yeah yeah and we'll do stupid shit <laughs> and there's so many performance programs that do not have stage combat. I didn't get my stage combat training formally. I took one 45 minute workshop at a festival while I was in university and didn't get proper training until really after my, after my first master's degree yeah. and had to seek it out very, very like, you know, diligently until i found the people who could, who could teach me and i was lucky i was in new york where i'm with some of the best teachers in the world and then i you know in academia land i was once at a book launch reading for someone who wrote the history of the acting training in the united states it was a book about that there's a few books about that and you know he talked about i, I covered all of the major tracks of acting training and i asked him like oh did you write anything? Did you track the history of stage combat in the United States? And he went, oh, no, I don't think that's important. Why do you ask? <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> well, and this leads into my first question, and we kind of uh, touched upon it already. But um, if you could just say, what is the biggest misconception people have about, uh, you know, screen or on screen or, or stage fighting? I think the biggest misconception is is its relationship to reality yeah i think that that, that is on my list i want to talk about that yeah is that it is far they they think it has a far closer relationship to reality than it actually does yeah. and then there's smaller misconceptions where people think it's improvised or people think that they just that I, i've heard someone once say that a stunt that they thought stunt men were like just people picked up off the street to like take a hit for someone. Well, Wait. in their defense, there, there are movies in which that was the case. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so. And it's also, it's one of those things where because they're only exposed to the final product, yeah. there's, there's some excuse for that. But because the overwhelming majority of the violence they see is fake, maybe we should address that. Yeah, there's there's this older movie, and I'm blanking on the name and on the actors in in which there's two guys fighting. I think it's in a hotel room, um, and and they really go at it. I mean, they ended up with broken ribs and everything, and they're just beating the crap out of each other. Um, it still doesn't look real. Yeah, there's. I have theories about certain kinds of violence and how they relate to different time periods. So I feel that I. I'm I'm a theater historian, not a movie historian. Yeah. So, but you know, there's overlap. But I remember watching movies that were soon after World War II, where the gunplay was all we would consider it understated today. Yeah. But if you think about who your movie going population was, it was a lot of people who just came back from war. Yeah. And then if you look at what the portrayal of gun violence on screen looks like now, it's gun fu. And it's gorgeous and it's amazing. It's it's beautiful and it's narratively ridiculous. 
And, you know, I think the John Wick movies are particularly interesting because we're watching, I think they have some of the best narrative because we're watching the character solve problems in real time and it's not the yeah. usual stuff. But I also remember watching a recent Israeli movie about this police special forces team. The uh, Fauda? No, it's it's a movie. It is, I would have to look it up, but it's basically you have these anarchists who uh, are, something else yeah. yeah i'm thinking of a tv show on netflix well, i know fauda i but the, okay. this this is a movie this wasn't a tv show okay okay the sole violence that takes place like the, the gunfight that takes place is seconds long they shut the lights down in the cellar where they're holding the captive they come in with night vision goggles they fire a handful of bullets kill the people holding them hostage and that's the entire gunfight and it's also a society with compulsory military training yeah. that is also having lots of terrorist attacks. So they probably don't have the resources to do a Hollywood gunfight or to try to do a Hollywood gunfight, but there's too many people in the population that know what the real thing looks like. Where That, that makes a really good, good point. And, and that's one of the questions that I want to ask you. If you look at, for instance, you just mentioned the evolution of of fight choreography, whether it's in movies or or uh, on uh, on the stage, I'm more of a movie person. I'm not really that much of a theater theater guy. Mostly having to do with uh, the type of productions that are available over here. Access is the biggest thing. Yeah, I mean, Belgium's a small country. Um, uh, if if I just look at my notes here, I mean, if if you go to the older John Wayne movies, where it's the, just a punch out in the saloon, the really big haymakers that they that he drew. Um, there's a lot of that. Eventually, we get the martial arts craze, starting with Bruce Lee, and and then that had a huge influence. Now we get to something along the lines of the like the John Wick movies, because he does a lot of hand to hand combat as well. But there's also the the Marvel super superhero genre. So there's this, these evolutions, I think, and these genres that obviously have certain conventions, but yeah. but it, it seems to change. Like you said, like Gung Fu, uh, that's the yeah. the old um, Christian Bale movie where they do kind of like gun kata stuff, and oh. I'm, I'm blanking on the name. Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, it's equally, one of the best gun ones. It's one of the best Gung Fu movies. Yeah, it, it's a it's a gorgeous choreography. Oh yeah. And but I think one of the other things that happens, if we think about, you know, the genre of simulated violence, yeah. this is, this includes professional wrestling. This includes theater, film, different flavors of film. And one of the things I kind of noticed in professional wrestling is that because the most popular, I think I, I, I have friends who are very into professional wrestling and will watch, like they've introduced me to like old bouts and or old shows. I don't know that we could call them bouts or matches. Yeah. Professional wrestling matches used to be longer. And they used to be longer when boxing was the most popular combat sport. Because hmm. a boxing round versus a UFC round is much longer. Yeah. So now that MMA is the most popular, most well-known combat sport, professional wrestling is latching on to that i think there's also things about what martial arts are current and like what's popular because a lot of los angeles because we have the dan, dan anasanto academy is in los angeles and every there's so many people are studying there yeah. and when uh, the jason Bourne movies came out no one knew what filipino martial arts was and now it's everywhere yeah. and there was a period where and i think perception of martial arts because we want when you talk about simulated violence you're also talking about martial arts training and this gets us back to rory miller and the meditations on violence and if someone is doing a lot of taekwondo forms and yeah. that's the concept of what violence looks like you're going to see movies with a lot of high kicks yeah of course you're gonna see a lot of very clean connected high kicks and then if someone's doing a lot of MMA, like, you know, suddenly everyone's grab, suddenly you're watching all these Brazilian jiu-jitsu holds in our movies, because that's, you know, kind of what's, what's in the cultural awareness. And 
there's uh, you know, I I need to finish writing this book. I'm working on a on a book about story structure and performance of violence. I call it fight it like one of my articles that's been passed around a lot is called Phytoturgy, which comes from uh, it's a play on dramaturgy. But when I I wrote my my doctoral dissertation was on the representation of martial arts on the American stage. And I talked a lot about what I the phrasing I called it is the impossible body. And it's where the human body is doing things that are physically impossible, but narratively really clear. Comic book heroes are all impossible bodies. Yeah. Like you know, Superman, Superman being able to fly and shoot laser beams and be super strong is really important for the narrative but you cannot get that to happen. Um, a lot of times when we're representing martial arts on stage or on screen, it's also impossible. Where, you know, the tiny person going bing and knocking out someone five times their size is a great fantasy, but, you know, good luck. So, but having be us being exposed to that narrative constantly, there's a disconnect. Yeah. And I think, you know, people like, I think especially people like, like your audience who are looking to bridge the gap between martial arts and reality and maybe not even bridge the gap, but combine it. When you're exposed to all of your entertainment, your entertainment is going to confuse your reality. Unless you're really getting this kind of, um, like this uh, fluency, this fluency in the language of entertainment violence. Yeah. And professional wrestling has a lot of stuff where like someone had their like five deadly moves and you would know, and the fans would know that the five deadly moves have begun and what they do. And that kind of detachment let them enjoy the narrative, but you wouldn't ever see someone try that in a fight. Yeah. And and uh, I I think that's that's the most interesting part uh, is that because people are so used to having the, most of the violence that they see uh, coming from movies and the and and TV screen and so on is is you, like you said you you get to this this place where there's these expectations and there's this this basically reprogramming in their mind of like this is what violence is like. And yeah. problems problems of, often start obviously when <laughs> when you go out and try it for real, because <laughs> that can backfire tremendously. Yeah. And even the shows that a lot of people think get it right actually don't. And um, a while ago, I, I was uh, I did a special video on my Patreon with one of my friends who was actually a historian and also a martial artist, and we talked about medieval martial arts and so on. Um, and, and and there's another tangent that I, I can go into uh, regarding that. And I'll put a link in the show notes towards that talk. So we, we talked for three hours. I'm going to do it again, looking at some medieval manuscripts and, and talk about that. Um, but we both like the TV show Banshee. There's yes. a lot of violence in there. And a lot of people are like, this is real. I'm like, no, it isn't. No, it's this not is real. realist at all, but it's gritty. It's intense. It's, it's sometimes horrifying. Well, and what is that that makes people think it's real? because I love this show, Yeah, is there's actual consequences. Yeah. So they're, they're confusing the narrative clarity of cause, effect, and consequence with reality. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm going to push back a little bit, um, because it depends on how you obviously are going to you know define consequences. But the, the biggest example is the fight. Uh, I'm, I'm blanking on her name. Um, his his ex his ex girlfriend who he was looking up, and she has a fight with this big hulking guy. Yeah, and 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 I mean, the amount of punishment that she can get away with before she actually wins that fight is like, no, 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 <laughs> this is so far yeah. removed from. I think they accurate consequences. Okay, said, okay, this, okay, they were good. But, but I think that that's where I guess the qualifier has to come in, and this is where we have to have like you know. Precision of language. When That's why I asked, what What do you mean with consequences? Yeah, yeah, because like you know, the consequences if someone gets hit, they're hurt. Are they hurt in proportion to how hard they were hit? Probably not for reality, but for within the rules of the world they're in, there is you know it's, it's scaled. 
Yeah. And I think we lose sight of things as um and as people who are consumers of it when the scale is wrong. And some of the Marvel movies, they're thrown up, their scale is thrown off. Yeah. I think the most recent Ant-Man was the the scale kept changing of how come this person can flick their wrist, flick their wrist and destroy an army, but if you punch them, they're suddenly hurt where before they weren't. How come this like the the, the effective the relative effectiveness of people in conflict kept changing and was inconsistent, where in Banshee it was often consistent throughout. And there was just something of like, you know, this if someone got hurt, they stayed hurt for at least a few minutes. Yeah. And okay, so okay. I see what you mean now. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Because Game of Thrones too, like, you know, Game of Thrones had some, there was one really amazing exchange where this is what armor versus no armor looks like. But there was also, if someone got their hands cut off, their hands stayed cut it off. stays off, yeah. Yeah. If someone died, they stayed dead. Like. And, and I, I can, one of the things that I noticed uh, a long time ago, and, and that is so common, in, especially in TV shows nowadays, but also in movies, no idea how far that goes in stage. But what, when you have a female protagonist that needs to still continue going on, you know, do whatever she needs to do for the plot to move along, and she ends up in a physical confrontation, what you very often see is the guys doing this backhanded slap or like a back fist type movement. And her head snaps back and she falls. And it is more or less realistic that, you know, she can get up and keep fighting and get to the weapon or get to whatever or escape and so on. Whereas in so many cases, the guy, the character uh, who does that, that slapping motion or backhand is, has clearly proven that he has no regard for women and using violence against them or for using violence in general on anybody. That is a ruthless character, and all of a sudden he is going to hold back and not throw this big right or left hook to knock her out, and mm -hmm. because that would you know mess up the plot, then she can't get escape okay. or, or beat him. So it's it's getting it happens so often that I start noticing it, and I'm like it pulls me completely out of the stories. Like that guy would never slap her; he would headbutt her, knock her out, choke her unconscious break her knee whatever but but not that not the slap because he just punched that guy over there and was vicious in the way that he mauled him and now he's going to be gentle doesn't make any sense i know exactly what you mean and i think that that's become kind of a narrative standard yeah but it cues the audience into like okay she yeah. isn't hurt that bad she can keep it that bad it cues that like well it also in terms of kind of the audience following it in story structure it gives it gives him one more crime so that when we watch him it's that much more justice because now he just did something on top of everything else he just did something sexist yeah <laughs> because like that this is one of the things i also wanted wanted to ask you if um when when people don't know what a fight director does and don't uh are, are not that fluent in like you said narrative structure and how do you actually present the story on stage on the screen and so on what are the techniques what is involved with that what is the purpose of a fight scene and i should say what are the purposes plural of a fight scene okay so this fight scenes are a very wide range so a fight scene might be because like so my biggest task is narrative clarity my bit, biggest tasks are safety and narrative clarity in that order and we will sacrifice narrative clarity for safety yeah i mean we should always have both but if you have if you're in a position where you have to choose you go with something safer um so the perp so the fight in, in ideal circumstances you shouldn't be able to tell when the fight director's job began and the director's ended and vice versa. So it should be seamless where it's part of the acting. So it, so the fight director's job is to create the story of the fight. The story of the fight, and the fight could be a slap, the fight could be a mass battle, the fight could be a duel to the death. The fight sometimes, you know, I've been called in to choreograph a heart attack because hmm. someone had to you know, sustain the heart attack and get to the ground safely. 
And that was something where it was my job to talk them through and navigate how that was going to go. So what will typically happen? And so in an ideal situation, the actors have had training as part of their lives. They've had sufficient training and they've maintained their training. The director in, in the way that I think I'm, I'm answering your question with a larger context. Yeah, that's fine. So let's say I'm going to do Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet, I'm picking that one because everyone knows, it's a safe bet everyone knows that one. There's three major fight scenes. There's the first fight scene where the two families, servants all get into it and then the government intervenes. There's the two duels where um, Mercutio Tybalt and then Tybalt Romeo. And there's Paris and Romeo at the end. And then there's possibilities of incidental violence there's the overlay that that Romeo and Juliet was written shortly after the first Italian fencing master published a treatise in English. So there's tons of references to that, to Vincenzo Saviolo, to Vincenzo Saviolo's manual. And there's a lot of the conflict between some of the men and the, or the characters can be played male or female, and I've done both, but there's a lot of, between Mercutio and Tybalt a lot of the things they say about each other are about the arguments about fencing. So I would read Romeo and Juliet for the 5,000th time. I would send the director a list of these are the big fights. These are the incidental fights. These are some of my suggestions. These are, and this is how I, I'm wondering how you want to proceed. Cause I've done Romeo and Juliet probably eight times in my career. And I've done it with high school kids, with adults, with uh, puppets. I've done the opera version. I've done West Side Story, if we want to like go a little bit far afield. I've done it in a lot of ways. And then the director and I and the stage manager will have a conversation about what they want, um, how, if we want to, how, much, how many hours they can give me, what world they're setting it in because Romeo and Juliet with rapier and dagger is gonna be very different than Romeo and Juliet with knives, which is gonna be very different than Romeo and Juliet with lightsabers. I've yet to get someone to do lightsabers. That would be awesome. <laughs> Romeo, thou art a villain. <laughs> so yeah, so one day, or Romeo, if it's a post-apocalyptic post Romeo and Juliet and it's baseball bats and chains and, you know, whatever else like that that's a choice but let's say they're gonna do renaissance whatever we're gonna call renaissance so we're saying we're doing we're doing it with rapier and dagger and or rapier and dagger for the nobleman characters and for the act one scene one the rumble in verona we're gonna have you know less complex weapons or we're gonna have like common people's weapons there's gonna be stabs there's gonna be Someone may have a sword, like a long sword. There's going to be kind of mixed weaponry. And since the townspeople are all going to get involved, someone's going to get bashed in the head with a bucket, because why not? And when the prince's guards come in, they're going to be having like shields and clubs, which is not really Renaissance, but, you know, no one knows. And <laughs> another thing I say is that, you know, you, you choreograph the weapon in the hands, not the weapon in the museum. Yeah. So one of the things I would hope I would get to do is to have a conversation with the actors about the world they're in and about dueling tradition. I have a, a close friend who's also a fight choreographer and a Shakespeare scholar where she and I did a podcast a few years ago about how if you don't understand dueling traditions, you're missing out on a significant portion of Shakespeare. So I did a high school Romeo and Juliet many years ago where there was this one kid who was playing Tybalt who Tybalt for those who are not on top of their Shakespeare, he's, if he's on stage and he almost every scene he's in for Romeo and Juliet, he's fighting. And he's, um, he's, he's someone whose Shakespeare paints as the advocate of the Italian dueling system. Now, Vincenzo Saviolo's book came in two parts. Part one was etiquette. Part two was how to kill somebody with a rapier and dagger. So you had to get through the etiquette before you could either get out of fighting or get into the fight. So Tybalt's first words 
is that he sees Benvolio, one of the one of the Montagues, trying to stop the fight with his sword out. So his line is, what drawn among these heartless hinds? What you have your weapon out among the peasants? What the fuck is up with you? And then his next line is, turn and face your doom. And then Benvolio says, I do but keep the peace. Help me. I'm trying to stop the fight. Yeah. yeah. Help me out. And then Tybalt's next line is coward. And then they have a fight that gets broken up. When I talked to so this kid came out and he's shouting all his lines, which was really boring. And I met him and he was capable of more than that. And I did my best to communicate Vincento Saviolo and etiquette. And this is what was going on. And this light bulb went above, went up over this kid's head and he went, Oh, Tybalt just wants everyone to be classy. And he gave the most nuanced Tybalt I've ever seen. Like this high school kid in Framingham, Massachusetts was like one of my favorite Tybalt's of all time. So when he said, you know, draw, he, instead of shouting when he was talking to this to the kid playing Benvolio and he said turn and face your doom and he said coward he was just so disappointed he wasn't mad he was disappointed and he was so disappointed that this other guy wasn't following the rules of etiquette as he understood them and his nuances around that so I would want to communicate that I'd want to navigate and negotiate what weapons we're doing what i'm on a lot of tangents i hope this isn't an no no it's fine it's fine i'll 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 ask some more after so i would want to navigate how many hours i have with them and i would want to you know work in okay here's what's happening because there you know there's and you know i also ask about intensity so what i used to ask is on a scale of one to audience and therapy for life where would you like this because there's certain things that you know when you're in the narrative and you want to have consequences, like people are dying. People are getting horribly hurt. People are watching their best friends die. And I took a workshop early in my career where it was just so um, Mercutio and Tybalt get into a duel because Romeo refuses to duel because Romeo just married Tybalt's cousin and he doesn't want to kill his own cousin. And Romeo tries to stop them from fighting and Tybalt kills Mercutio. And it's written, I died under your arm. So it's unclear if Tybalt, it's a, it's a narrative choice of did Tybalt kill him by accident or did Tybalt do this incredibly underhanded thing? Yeah. And it can be played either way. It could be choreographed either way. It's a narrative decision that should be made between everyone involved, the actors, the director, the fight choreographer. So however it happens, Tybalt kills Mercutio, Mercutio is has the speech plague upon both your houses uh a villain who killed by a villain who fights by the book of arithmetic he's referring to the fencing manual and making fun of the fencing manual he dies romeo goes and kills tybalt so typically and narratively the tybalt mercutio fight is flash and trash and let's see some really intense moves and let's see a lot of really cool stuff romeo tybalt so pragmatically, you have the problem of your actor playing Tybalt has to memorize a shit ton of choreography and is probably tired. And narratively, you have Romeo just had his best friend die. And the guy who killed his best friend, who he refused to fight before, who insulted him in the streets, is right there. So at this workshop, it was like, how can you have Romeo punish Tybalt? And you know, then you have the decision of is Romeo the baddest blade in all Verona and he's a lover, not a fighter? Has Tybalt been injured in his fight? So Romeo, who's a lover, not a fighter, could beat him more easily? Does Romeo just, bat- like, why, why does Romeo beat Tybalt? So questions I ask is like when Tybalt and Mercutio fight, if it were a fair fight, who would win? A fair fight. If it were a fair duel, who would win? When Romeo and Tybalt fight, if it were a fair duel, who would win? If it's not a fair duel, why is it not a fair duel? Is it a duel? So if Romeo like pulls Tybalt down to the ground, wrestles him, and like I think I 
I showed this. So someone asked me like, what's the, like, you know, show me audience and therapy for life. And I think you pulled this photo from the cloud. Oh, I, I, I want to talk about the photo in a minute. Yeah. So um, I, I did that where it was like, this is like, I want Romeo to force his mouth open and shove the dagger into his mouth slowly. And I showed them what that would look like. And the cast was all for it. <laughs> and the um, the powers that be at that institution were like, we would like to keep our jobs. And that's a little bit too graphic. <laughs> but uh, let's let's just let's just cut his throat. <laughs> that's better. <laughs> yeah. Which kind of tells you, like, you know, what are we desensitized to where we said, like, OK, this is what a throat cut looks like. Other story I have from one the first time I did Romeo and Juliet, the guy playing Paris was a math instructor at Harvard. And I was explaining, like, okay, when you're cut here, you want to have your your arm turn a little bit because the blade would be cut and you're just going to signal to the audience that was cut. And I said, Oh, yes, of course, there would be a drag coefficient between flesh and steel. <laughs> so I use that so much. I'm like, so when you're cut, you need to take into account the drag code. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> and, and for for, for the folks me? listening or, or watching, uh, the the picture that I that I used to announce that we were that you were coming on the podcast uh, was was you showing in a class how to drive a knife into somebody's mouth. So that's what we were just talking about, and and you can see the students in the background of the cast. I don't know what it was, just laughing and smiling, like ooh. Like everybody's like all excited, like, oh, this is awesome. And then the powers that be say, no, 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 we're not, we're not going to do that. Yeah. That's too much. So that was, that wasn't, so that the photo is from a class, a workshop I taught on uh, dramaturgy for okay. five direct. So I had already, you know, so I was, I was in the room of, you know, many of the people in that room are like pretty successful fight directors now. The guy who I'm on top of, is um, a very capable fight director and teacher. His name is Rob Aronowitz. I am continually grateful that I am seen on film shoving a knife <laughs> down someone. Probably have bench pressed me off of him with one arm. But so he was a very good sport for being the demo for that. Uh, the photographer is Theek Smith, who's a phenomenal photographer. But I was explaining, and so I, I teach this workshop that um, this is this is the framework of the book that I need to finish writing, where I talked about dramaturgy. It's it's story structure and stage combat, but it's also all of the other things around what what makes the story. And when you talk about the framing of how intense do you want it, there's certain things we know people react to narratively. So someone getting their throat slit on stage, it's it's a symbol of it's a physical language of one character made this move with this object near this other character and they gasped and fell down and that's a throat slit. And you'll get it narratively and you'll get that, that that's what happened, but you won't have a visceral response. You know, having been a scholar of the humanities and social sciences, I paid attention to what actually bothers people. Soft tissue damage really bothers people. And we don't get a lot of soft tissue damage in our entertainments. So that particular photo, I was like, let's demonstrate a move that is going to get a visceral reaction because you're watching soft tissue damage. And it's here's how you create this illusion in the proscenium, proscenium, so a stage where the audience is all on one side. So we have the actual prop weapon is actually on the opposite side of my scene partner's head at that point. I'm leaning into, I have the prop up against my chest. So I'm demonstrating that my body weight is controlling it narratively. Really my core is holding me at the right place. And my scene partner has his arms on my arms, which makes it look like he's trying to force me off. But in reality, we're supporting each other. And then we slowly watch this go into what we appear to go down his throat and one of the things about why people laugh a lot in stage combat is we're getting violence without consequences <laughs> so there's a i i refer i refer to this a lot about like the pleasure of this is um there's a, a 
a while ago now, this psychology study came out where these guys thought that they solved humor and they call it benign violation theory. And they said, in order for the pleasure response that we understand as humor to happen, something must be a violation of accepted beliefs and be benign. So me shoving a prop knife down someone's throat and them writhing around like it's real, but all of us knowing that he's okay is hilarious. Yeah. But we're also out of the narrative. If it's in the narrative and people are in the story and they're responding to that, like they're going to get it. Things around eyes upset people. That's also soft tissue. Uh, character humiliation upsets people. If Romeo made Tybalt beg for his life, that would have a much more visceral response than if Romeo, if Romeo like put Tybalt down and just started breaking pieces. Yeah. That's that would get an effect. Um, certain things that are demonstrations of, you know, really huge differences of power will affect people or will affect anyone who's not a sociopath. So when you're starting to have that, and like, no, I tell actors, this should have the emotional content of a card trick because, you know, the character feels that you don't. And this is why, you know, I talk about, you know, the, uh, the unlicensed abusive group therapy where people are digging into their worst traumas you know we have ways of creating narrative where people are not actually having to be traumatized and but you know you'll want to work with the director and say okay just how bad do you want this to be and certain things should look really bad yeah and you know there's there's a very famous play where someone is uh someone fucks the skull of a dead body um that's pretty bad <laughs> yeah so like if you're doing that you shouldn't be uh lightening it up there's some plays that are and like there's some plays you know i wouldn't you know there's some uh adults only plays where if you're gonna do this like there's some plays where we do put up like hey this is really violent um i've done you know everything from you know, I, I, I'd say like, you know, from my scale of one to audience in therapy for life, I was like, you know, a zero is bunnies eating ice cream in a field. A 10 is me coming up with the worst things I can imagine in this circumstance. And a thing that come that came up a few times in my career was people's like, okay, show me the worst thing you can do. <laughs> and I did. And they went, okay, not that bad. <laughs> And I've had long time long time collaborators where they understood like, you know, we had a good communication of scale. Uh, they were like, this scene should be exactly this bad. No more, no less. Like this is the level of severity that we want to see here. And that's like having that nuance. I think that's a nuance that is often lost. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to come back to my question a little bit and, and because you touched basically on, on pretty much uh, everything that I, that I talked about. I, I had in my notes, like when, when people look at fight scenes, they're like, oh, it's about fight. No, it's not about a fight. It's about, it's about so much more. Um, yeah. You could advance the plot, like create a new conflict or like typically the Rocky movies, like the fight is the climax. That's the end of the yeah. movie. Um, show character. Yeah, one of the things that Barry Eisler told me about his writing is that what I try to do is always uh, introduce my character in character. Yes. Like uh, um, he writes about a, a, a hitman, an assassin. And for instance, this is one of the things you, you don't know. And, and, and I hope I'm not spoiling it for all the, the John Rain fan, fans. But um, he says one of the things you'll notice that if as he is going to, for instance, prepare for a hit, He's he's kind of grumpy, and and that is just the stress building up. And when he's actually performing that that um, that hit, it's sort of different. And when he's relaxing in the bar, it's sort of different. So you you show you show character whenever you can. You yeah. Show, show don't tell, uh, as they always say. Um, the try try fail cycle. 
is typical in many movies and in, and in many, many stories. Like the hero has to fail a number of times. And that means that he's going to get beat up first. He's going to lose a fight. Rocky oh, yeah. loses fights and then, you know, he wins. Uh, convey emotions, obviously. Um, but one of the things that, that I like is that you show the true nature of, of violence and conflict. Um, if there is a conflict brewing between the characters and it comes to a head and that it results in violence, it can show the true nature of humanity. Yes. Which which ha- which is a range because then often people think well, we're talking about like like you said, your ten, your worst thing. No, no, that's not the only thing that we can show there. We can show mercy, we can show um, you know, an epiphany, we can show show characters that have a change of heart. We can show so many things there. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, when I teach Romeo and Juliet in like history classes, I refer to Rory Miller's like um categories of violence and i take the first one that's like this is a group monkey dance and these are people who are showing their allegiance to a group by fighting this other group and no one dies and when it's tybalt mercutio that's a monkey dance when it's romeo tybalt that's an educational beatdown and the lesson is you're dead and the last one, the Romeo Paris, they're fighting over a resource. I mean, uh, we're objectifying Juliet because Juliet is the resource, but that like it is violence for different reasons, and it's this articulation of character. And they say too that like no one, no one is going to look for like no one wants no one's watching Hamlet do a cool move. They're watching a character in trouble. If a cool move makes sense, that's great, but it's really narrative. And when the cool moves don't match the narrative, we lose interest. So, and I think that that's, that's one of the, the larger things that I, that I, like the things I think about a lot, like outside of choreography or like relation of choreography are the relation to the larger perceptions of violence by the general public. Yeah. And how the general public understands violence more because of the fake than the real. And within entertainment, how there's often not enough appreciation for it. Yeah. So, like, yeah, yeah not there. Yeah, that, 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 I, I totally agree with that. And the, I've been talking about this for a long time, so people who listen to the show might get bored of, of me saying it. But but as we've had so many years of people, uh, like you said, you know, we're living in, in in very safe times, so the exposure they get to violence is always recreational. Um, that it distorts their view of reality, and it it basically conditions them to ex- expect certain things uh, to work or not work, and they can be they are often very wrong. But it also changes policy. Policies get enacted on a governmental level, on a societal level, by people who think they know what they're doing, but they've never hit somebody in anger or been hit in anger or been physically attacked by somebody who really means it. So they have, uh, like Mark likes to say, fantasy solutions to fantasy problems. Yes. And but in real life things tend tend to escalate and all of a sudden you get like well, what is this? Like um yesterday uh, I put it on my Facebook page um I'm driving to a client uh, next to a small town just outside of Brussels and as I'm rolling up his his house is really next to uh, the train station and there's a, a police officer on a motorbike just just racing past me you know flashing lights and everything. And uh, he just jumps off his bike, runs into the into the train station. I'm like, okay, not the first time I've seen that. So I parked the car, and this is literally, literally like I don't know, like fifty yards from 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 that guy's house. Uh, I go inside. I said, like, there's something going on in um, in a train station. So so this cop running, and they say, oh yeah, it's probably just you know kids fighting again. So it's a regular thing, right? So then we get to hear more and more sirens, uh, you know, arriving. And like, oh, this is more than his daughter who takes the train, comes from a different city, and she has to get there. She's like, my train's canceled. I can't get there. Then on the local WhatsApp 
groups and Facebook groups and everybody's home in that town, the, the stuff gets in. Long story short, two youth gangs go at it. Uh, later we learned that one of them was walking around with a katana. Um, and this is kind of this running battle is ensuing. And three guys end up on the train tracks. Two, one of them makes it back out of there and uh, the high-speed train rolls in. One of them is instantly dead. The other one is an uh, amputated leg uh, and obviously a, a, a huge mess. And I'm like, yes, that's how violence goes. It's that, not kid fighting. This, 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 is not, this is not the stage. This is not TV or movies. That's how violence goes. And somebody talked to me about that. It's like, and I said, I literally was there just like the minute before it happened. If I had arrived there one minute earlier, I would have been driving down a one-way street with no way of backing up. Is that was it possible there were cars behind me. You, I, can't, I couldn't turn. It was, it's too narrow, that street. Um, and I would be rolling into a big fight with about 40 people involved. So, I, so what do you do, Wim? I try to get the hell out of there. That's what I do. Wouldn't yeah. you get involved? No, I wouldn't get involved. Are you crazy? It's 40 people. There's nothing yeah. I can do. I don't know who's doing what to whom and yeah, why. It's got a katana. Yeah, and so which, like, which we didn't what, know at the time. But it sharpens katanas in Belgium. So, like, <laughs> oh, like, like, why, why is this like very specific Japanese weapon so widely available? Like, that's part of like the like how are how are these things? How how are we so detached from what things are? So yeah. I was thinking about this a lot when uh, I think I I finished. I, I think I finished writing big chunks of my dissertation not long after they got Osama bin Laden. Yeah. And one of the things I remember about that time is a lot of the commentary about it from certain quarters sounded like people that were critiquing watching someone else play the boss level of a video game. And where they're like, well, if they did this, this, and this, they could have taken him alive. And it's like, no, they had one shot. These were very highly trained people in an incredibly dangerous situation. And the critique, it just the, the critique sounded like people who were playing a video game. It just it sound, it didn't sound like critique of reality. It sounded like critique of a video game. And there's some stuff like I think I I, I was I spent seven years as a student instructor for Impact. And yes. So um, I did that while while I was living while I was living in Boston while I was in grad school, and it was uh, the guy who trained me told me it would be the weirdest job you'd ever love. And one of the ways I mean, absolutely influenced me as a martial artist, influenced me as a choreographer in terms of the stuff before and after violence, because it's also like it's not just like the violence doesn't start when someone punches someone it starts when someone tries to figure out if they have a reason to public to punch someone and in the narratives when we talk about like this is human nature like we're higher primates and higher primates fight each other or higher primates compete over different things they compete over resources they compete for status they compete for the status in their own heads but when you see kind of because like you know you couldn't put anything on impact in choreography it's too sloppy it doesn't look like anything but when you think about okay this is what the escalation looks like this is what de-escalation looks like this is you know watching people experience the adrenal the adrenaline dump and then act on the adrenaline dump and kind of watching how that turns on their minds about what this is really like and I'm assuming that your audience is familiar with impact and adrenal stress conditioning. Oh, I think so, yeah. yeah. So it's something that is so, but it I can say too, it felt like choreography. Yeah. There was so much of it that was under so much control of the instructor in the suit that I like, because we're the ones who are deciding when the fight is over. We're deciding when and how it escalates and once the student is amazing at the escalation. And even then, we're deciding certain obstacles that we can put in place of the students. And it's some of the most effective training, but it's still it's still a simulation. Well, I, I talked to Bill Kipper about this uh, years ago, and he was, for, for folks who don't know, um, you know, the, the primary bullet man, I think, of Peyton Quinn, and he does 
uh, fast defense. And uh, I, I got to do, use one of his suits, his, uh, his gladiator suits for one of my Paladin Press video shoots. That was awesome. I mean, I, I didn't have to hold back. I could just beat up my demo partner. Um, anyway, and, and, and he said people think it's it's the, the suit and the helmet that they make that, that that's the important thing. He says it's not. It's the it's the software. It's not the hardware. It's the teaching. It's the scenarios. The way you build the scenarios. The the acting that the guy in the suit does and and so on. And, and like you just said, it's like you've got so much control over what's going on there. You've got you can just steer this in a, in a specific direction. So you can actually give a certain experience to the student um, so that they learn what what you want them to learn. Yeah, and I can say too that like there's some stuff around that when you talk about like the software and how things play in people's heads. So I'm I'm not a large guy. So I'm about 5'8". I am, you know, average height. So I taught a men's class once and the things that had to come out of my mouth to give someone an adrenaline dump were like, like cause I, I, and I remember like when you talk about the software of like, what can I say that's gonna make this person react and you know you figure it out i think yeah. one of the favorites one of the things i used to say is because people have the nervous response of smiling and be like why do you have so many teeth i have to go get my pliers <laughs> and it doesn't matter if you're short like that'll get someone an adrenaline dump or it was also like um the program we taught in was just also extremely aware of people being trauma survivors yeah and there was uh people who were sent to us by mental health professionals was like, this is what the bad guy said, say that. Okay. And, and well, the responses we got, because it was this really incredible program because people who had been assaulted had been living in this PTSD like loop, got to replay the scenario, except they won and they got their lives back. And yeah. It was like one of the most rewarding aspects. And there was also one point where we were in the curriculum of several high schools. And there was this one high school where we were coming in and I had to change into my gigantic suit in the faculty bathroom of the library. And these two little old New England librarian ladies pull me over. They're like, you're with the impact? I'm like, yes, I'm with the impact. We just wanted to let you know, one of our favorite students took your class and some asshole tried to rape her in college and she beat the shit out of that guy. Nice. Uh, that's great. Uh, right. I love those kind of stories. I, I, I did one, um, this is a long time ago, uh, that I did a, a self defense for Women class. Um, it was a, you know, several months, actually. And, and the quote-unquote graduation uh, was that they had to do scenarios with me and I was you know, suited up, a little bulletman suit, but something on those lines. And it was one one woman. She was the smallest of, of the whole bunch. Um, but afterwards, <laughs> I, I learned that she played soccer uh, uh, as a hobby. And anyway, we do the scenario. In the scenario, she she has to put me on the ground, and she does it. She's a great job. And she just soccer kicks me in the throat, like not holding back. If I didn't have protection there, and I remember when I was you know making my suits, like should I wear that today? Yeah, I'm gonna wear it anyway. <laughs> It's gonna be fine. Just just put it on because it was a little bit bothersome to put on, and I mean that was a lethal blow. And oh, afterwards, yeah. uh, we 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 talked, and because um, well, you know what it's like working with people who've been traumatized. That sometimes they they will tell you up front. Sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes it's after the class is over. And that was the case with me. And she said, you know, that she she'd obviously had uh, suffered through some traumatic uh, stuff, and that being able to do that to me liberated her oh yeah, yeah and, and this is one of the things I've, I've i'm fortunate that i have a few of those is that on my deathbed when i'm over, looking back at my life i'll have done some things right yeah and i think that that's i think that i have i have tried to get op-eds published about how violence dynamics needs to be part of a civics curriculum yeah and i've been blown off every time I mean, this is one of the times where I said that, you know, when it's useful, my name starts with doctor. <laughs> this is one of the times where, like, I put the letters there because that's supposed to be a thing. Yeah. And I've yet to get someone to accept that. But I think the, the failure to understand violence gives us more traumatized people. 
Yeah, this this is one of the things that I, I've, I made a meme a few years ago, and every time I share it, it gets a uh, it goes a little bit viral. You see a kid sitting there crying, and it's like the biggest, the, the worst lie. Uh, well-meaning adults ever told a kid was was that violence never solves anything. Because you are creating a victim. You are telling that guy, when you are being abused in the worst possible way, emotionally, mentally, but most of all physically, you're not supposed to do something about it. You have to take it. You're and then you get to. punished. Yeah, you, you get, and then in school with the, with, the, with the freaking nonsense of zero tolerance policy. It's like, who gets punished? Yeah, the guy doing the beating and the guy getting beaten up. The guy getting beaten up gets punished again. Because he's he's being he's being bullied, and then he gets beat up. And if he dares strike back or do anything, basically, we're like, no, no, that's what the, that's what teachers saw. You're both suspended or whatever. I'm like, don't teach your kids that. I I taught my kids. Listen, if you start fights, you're gonna have to fight me, because I I will I don't care how old you are. I'm gonna put you over my lap, and I'm gonna spank you, and your 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 ass will be blue. You won't like it. Uh, but you are nobody's punching back. If somebody starts a fight, you freaking finish it as fast as you can. You do not take that abuse. And then we talk obviously about tactics and stuff, and like you know, don't don't go up against fifteen people and and all that kind of stuff. But there, there's just way too many people, and unfortunately, in position, positions of power where they are, are like, no, no, violence is always bad. Like, no, it's not. Anyway. It's. A huge, huge problem. And I think so, like, I mean, for my own life, I think it's amazing how once I got relatively proficient at martial arts, I stopped being picked on. It's, yeah, but, surprising, right? <laughs> yeah, funny how that happens, how how once that was on the menu, things stopped happening. But I it is it, it is partially because we're safe, partially because what and you know, I say you know, everything someone has seen was probably created by someone like me, but they haven't talked to anyone like me. They only, they only see the final product. They don't see like, okay, this is, this is narrative and this is the way the narrative is supposed to be. And even within stage combat training, we try to be aware of if we're dealing with someone with trauma. Yeah. It, it's always, it's when I, why I talk about it has to have the emotional content of a card trick. Because if it's like, no, I want you to relive the worst assault you've ever received, or I want you to really emote, like, no, you don't. I, I want you to create, like, I, I think the the quote that I always say that keeps coming, that like, I think always comes up and how do I explain it is uh, stage combat is a combination of sleight of hand and ballroom dance. That's and, right. Yeah. And it's when you're talking to martial artists about it, I'd say... Because a lot of martial artists, you know, that's that's the point that can be the point of entry and they skip all the other stuff, which, you know, can cause a lot of misunderstanding. But um, the differences between partner and opponent are very different things Yeah, and that the illusion is cooperative. So that's that's the stuff that I would want a martial arts audience to understand is that the the distance there's there's a lot of distance between what I do as a fight director and what I've done as a martial artist or martial athlete and that everything is about when, when narrative and safety are your two biggest concerns, reality is not really the re, reality is a distant mix. Yeah. It's a distant part of the mix. There's one more question I want to ask before we get to the, the Patreon part. And, and that would be asking you for a pet beef. So you're, you're watching a play or a movie or TV show and, you know, and there's a there's a fight or violence scene. It's like holy crap! And I'll, I'll give you mine. Shaky camera. I freaking hate it. I hate it I, too. I think it was the second Born movie that really started that 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 fought, you know that that whole thing going. I don't think it was the first, but I think it well, was the, the second. Was, the first had brilliant fights. So um, there's a few movies where that was the case. The first Guardians of the Galaxy had great action. The second was Shaky Camera. Yeah. Shaky Camera is lazy. Shaky Camera means they, they're not paying their stunt crew. And, and I'm just quickly going to explain for the audience is that you, you if, and this this all comes back to you know just the technical aspects of what do you how do you see something on the screen or on the stage? You've got you know um, 
depth of field, you've got different camera angles, viewing angles, and so on. And then, like, if you show a bunch, if you can't show it from that angle, because otherwise everybody sees that it's fake, blah, blah, blah. So really, like you said, good, good, a good stunt crew, a good uh, fight, fight director will make that work for whatever the, the director asks. Not 100%, but most of it, you know, a good uh, professionals can, can handle that. But getting around that by just having this camera shaking and the image is shaking and gives this illusion of like, oh my God, this is so chaotic and there's so much stuff going on. But if you would watch that with, a, with just the camera not moving at all, you would see a crappy fight scene that is totally unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, so you're giving the audience a message that a fight is happening. So I'll say my stage pet peeves, because I think those are, because in, in film, you have different ways out of stuff. Yeah. Uh, when they clearly didn't hire a fight choreographer and put, I mean, this isn't a pet peeve. This is a, this is a major gripe. If they clearly didn't hire a fight choreographer and clearly needed to, <laughs> and they're, you, and they have something that looks bad where their actors are in danger. Now, wasn't there, wasn't there a few years ago that, that there was a, a death somewhere in the theater that there was with a, something going wrong or hanging or I'm, I'm blank. This is a few years someone ago. Someone gets shot on stage about once a year. Okay. Um, so I I have a list. I I I think I stopped adding to it recently, but um I I have a list on my website of just news stories of stage combat gone wrong. And there was a school in New Zealand where they were doing Sweeney Todd. Uh, for those unfamiliar with their Sondheim, it's a musical where there's a barber. It's taken from an English, an old English story where there's a barber who cuts his customer's throats and bakes them into pies. So very popular Sondheim musical. I think it's coming back to Broadway. There was a movie a few years ago. But um, a kid in a private high school in New Zealand got his throat cut. And someone gave, this is why I talk about where like, you know, people lose their damn minds on stage. It's like, oh, it's pretend. It's not pretend. You just put a razor on someone's throat. Um, there's stories about being punched out, people being punched out on stage, people being like anything that injures an actor is a major gripe. Um, where, where it becomes more pet peeve category of is um, when they clearly didn't give, the, when the actors are doing a move that doesn't fit the story. Yeah, like okay, someone was slapped or punched, but that slap or punch doesn't fit what's going on. Or another one is not even in the fight scenes themselves, but if actors are handling prop weapons and they're handling them really badly, or they're because that's part of like when I have my whole talk with actors, it's like okay, if if you're playing, let's say you're playing a samurai, if your sword is on your right side or your left side. That tells us a clear message about what your state of mind is and how you feel about the people around you. Yeah. So if you're going to have a moment where you move your sword from your left to your right, or from your right to your left, like that's it's not a fight scene, but it's it's fighturgy. It's telling us a lot about how you feel. So I've seen plays where people were supposed to be Japanese warriors and they just had their hands on their hilts the whole time. Hmm. And it just annoyed the shit out of me. And it's such an easy fit. Or um, just uh, bad prop gun handling. Like that's another one. And uh, I got some very basic firearm instruction a couple times. And there was one point where I told the instructor, it was a one-on-one -on -one class. And I, and I said, why are you taking this? And I said, because I'm, I'm a, partially from a martial arts point of view, partially because... I feel like I should know this stuff and partially because I'm a fight choreographer and he spent an extra hour with me teaching me all the things that movies got wrong. <laughs> nice. That's great. That was super useful. It's, it's, I mean, and, and speaking of another one, but, but because it's a small one, but uh, that buddy of mine, uh, with whom we do the, the medieval stuff, uh, we talked about that and, and there's, it's in one of the Thor movies, I forget which one, You've got Loki who arrives in Asgard, and Heimdall is the guardian, and he's got this, this huge broadsword that is point down as, and both hands uh, are on the handle, which is just how people stand sentry because it's it's too freaking heavy to carry. Mm -hmm. And then there's some there's some dialogue, and then the fight starts, and Heim, Heimdall swings first, and he does the stupidest thing ever. He changes his grip, comes all the way around over his head, and swings. 
And by that time, you know, uh, Loki has frozen him and, and, and obviously, you know, fights over. It's like, a, so A, Loki would be an idiot to stand that close, but that's, yep. but let's disregard that. But the proper technique is that you kick up the point of the sword and stab the guy, which is the freaking quickest way that you can handle that and not take the long way around going overhead, swinging with this weapon, which is, is, is going to be, you know, so one of the things extent, that same heavy. Go ahead. Well, it, it's narr- well, it's narrative clarity. I mean, exactly. that's what, and so it's narrative clarity. So there's a reason fencing is not a spectator sport. Yeah. And, and for the movie, it ends with this beautiful image with both characters standing next to each other. Uh, and you see you see Hamdall frozen in this, you know, extended position with his with his sword, and Loki just standing there, like, you know, whatever, you know, I've got I've got you. So it's a beautiful image and Oh, yeah. My guess is this is what the director wanted. We need to get there. Um, and so we're going to have basically the guy who's guarding the whole thing do the stupidest move ever. Yeah. But the thing is, the amount of people who realize the like the movie you described, and I believe that's in like the Talhoffer manual. <laughs> uh, but that move, it would be totally in place in John Wick. Yeah. Because it's clean, it's direct, and it's lethal. But the Marvel or the Mar- the Thor audience, it wouldn't it wouldn't have that dramatic build. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I see this as a missed opportunity. I think like you, it could have been an opportunity to show that Loki is is even smarter than he than you see him right yeah. now. Now he, he in that scene for me, this is just my opinion. Oh, yeah. I see him as like, okay, he's just faster. And, yeah. and, and Loki is a god of mischief and tricks and so on. And he's like, no, I'm just faster than you. You're too slow. It's like, that's not Loki. It's too... So the, the, the movie described is so subtle that to choreograph something like that in a way that audiences would understand. Yeah, yeah. Like I could see, I could see it fitting because it's also... I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I think that would be amazing. It would be so hard to slow it down enough for audiences to get it. Because so I, I grew up doing competitive fencing. When I started doing stage combat fencing, I continually felt like I was going to die. <laughs> because just the way you stand for stage fencing is already, you're so open, but you're setting up your points so they're not endangering your partner as opposed to opponent and you're setting things up to tell the story yeah. and you know you know for those watching at home i'm not going to demonstrate physically on the zoom screen but there's kind of a, a you you pull back by pulling back you're drawing the eye that this thing that i'm pulling back is going to go forward you go forward and you're kind of indicating i'm aiming at this piece of the person's body and then there's this reaction and the formula that is taught in stage combat, if someone's like, let's say, going to do a swing at someone's head and the other person ducks, is blade, body, body, blade. So you yeah. hold your blade up to indicate that you're going to cut their head. They duck. You step forward and then you swing the blade. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. it makes sense. Yeah. And it keeps everyone safe. And if they don't duck, you don't swing the blade. Yeah, and, and that makes absolutely like said, zero sense for real fencing. I, I, yeah. I had something similar when uh, my girlfriend and I went to salsa class, and there was this one one dance move in which you know we're both holding hands and, and I kind of spin her over around, and we kind of end up in this interlocked position with our arms, and everything in me was screaming arm bar, get your arm out of there, someone's going to break your elbow, and and I just I couldn't relax, it, it just couldn't I couldn't let it go. <laughs> And the teacher was was seeing like, okay, well, what's going on here? Like, excuse me, you know, I've been doing martial arts for a long time, and and this is all my instincts are screaming at me to just punch her or kick her or just, just break this grip immediately. She didn't understand. <laughs> funny. She was I, like, "What the hell is this guy saying?" <laughs> I tried to learn gymnastics when I was younger, and just everything said, "If I'm flying through the air upside down, it means other things have gone horribly wrong." Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, because I had the body control, I had the strength, but I was so resistant to being upside down in the air. 
Yeah, th this is one of the things I also have uh, with, with with weapons, and and um, I wrote an article not that long ago, you know, uh, about how to train with edged weapons. And this is not pet beefs, but some stuff that I see that I think people get wrong. It's like, okay, this is how you can fix that. And and I have that when I train with people who are not on the same wavelength when it when it comes to training with blade bladed weapons. I don't care if it's a training weapon. If it's blunt and it has no point, I don't care. I'm going to treat it as if it's a real one. Go to a firing range with a prop gun. It, it, it will be treated as if it's live ammo in there and it's going to blast your head off if you mess around with it. That yeah. is a proper way to train. There's nothing wrong with that. Actually, that's quite good to train that way. That's the Legally, if you hold someone up with the toy gun, you're treated as if it's a real gun. Exactly. Exactly. So, and, and we get back to what we've been talking about is people get their information from movies and TV and so on when it comes to violence and they're like, yeah, what, what to do? We try to bring out you know, information and talk about this, but I, I think it's an impossible task to convey the reality of violence on, on stage and on the screen. I think it's and, and for all the reasons that it needs to work in a story, it's, it's probably not going to work in real life and vice versa. But, but trying to educate people when it, about violence, I think, is an important task. And I was just talking to one of my clients about this. I said, look, because he's like, you're always going on about violence. And I'm like, the reason why it's so important to understand violence, and why I really agree with you when you say, like, the violence dynamics should be taught in civics class. If you start looking at how society functions and the laws that we have governing our societies, I would... I would say my claim would be that the vast majority of those laws have to do with avoiding violence breaking out in society, whether it's yeah. at an interpersonal level, whether it's group, whether it's civil war or war with another country. That's what laws are for. They avoid the friction and the conflicts or try to manage them before they escalate into violence. Does that make sense? Absolutely. No, that's... Um... That's a big, I mean, there's a lot of political theory around that too. And that's also like, at what point are the, at what point are the lessons so distant from the consequences? Because uh, the, so one of the debates that keeps going on in terms of scholars of like how real is, is stage is or was stage combat. And people talk about how, like, I keep going back to Shakespeare, but they said that, you know, Shakespeare had people in his company who were like expert fencers. And this was a day and age when people were actually fighting duels. So of course the duels in Shakespeare would have been very real. And it's like, why would you think that? Because there's also, we have we have a corollary or we, we have a, a parallel where we talk about in Japan, Kabuki has been around for a while. And you would have, and fights in Kabuki don't look like Kenjutsu. Yeah. And it would have been like, hey, there would have been samurai watching Kabuki. Why doesn't Kabuki look like Kenjutsu? And it's like, no, because Kabuki's interested in narrative. And that, like, that plays into how distant are we? I think, uh, I think professional wrestling is probably a pretty good barometer of yeah. how far we're from violence. Of like, what will what will audience what will audiences expect accept as narrative? Yeah. Because that's pretty it's, far out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, what will audiences accept as narrative is going to be a is going to be a measure of like how close they are to to actual violence. That's cool. All right, uh, Meryl, I, I want to get to the to the Patreon parts, the the second part of the podcast, because uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time. People are going or like, like where what happened? Um, where can people reach you? I will add that to the show notes. Your website is one place. My, my website is uh, www.maronlongsner.com. I'm the only person in the world with my name. So uh, anything with my name on it probably came through me. Okay. Uh, I have multiple articles in a few different outlets that are online. Um, I have a lot of stuff in the journal called The Theater Times where I write about stage combat a lot. I've also written about stage combat quite a bit in another outlet called HowlRound. Um, if you put in Marilyn Longsner stage combat, you'll get tons of stuff about that. In my own website, I have a blog. I have been neglecting it recently, but I have a bunch of stuff on that I need to follow up on. 
but I'm pub I, I have quite a few articles available online in different outlets if that's what people want to see. There's some examples of my choreography that you can see on my website. I've done much more theater than film, but there is some stuff. There's a, a lecture on my concept of the impossible body that you can see through my website. It's on YouTube. And if you want to buy luxury real estate in New York City, I can help you there too. See, see? excellent. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Meron, for, for taking the time. This, this was awesome. And, and for the audience, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, as I explained a while ago, I'm trying to get, you know, beyond just basically talking about self-defense and, and martial arts. Um, and the vast majority of people who are into that and do enjoy, you know, uh, a good uh, a good fight scene, whether it's on the stage or on the screen. So that's why I was very happy that you accepted my invitation. Um, we are going to head on over to the bonus part on Patreon for the people who want to listen to that, because I've got a, a bunch of fun questions from Aaron. Okay, folks, thanks so much for listening, and I will talk to you next time.